door. Never mind. <laughs> oh no, he's the next speaker. I just go for a minute. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the first uh, session of uh, Contributed Talks uh, this afternoon. I think we've got six speakers. Sorry, I just jumped in. Um, our first speaker is uh, David Watts from CSIRO, and he'll be talking about... Uh, I have the title on my phone, so you have to say it yourself. <laughs> Wait till the slides get up. Oops. Back one? Okay, thanks. I've been around for a very long time since essentially Obus started in about uh, two, in the early 2000s. Obus started as a, as a project of the Catalogue of Marine Life and it was started in the late 90s, I think, very late 90s. And uh, I was in the Antarctic Division Data Centre in 2003 under Lee Belbin and Rutgers University sent an email saying, we would like your seabird data. We had 50,000 seabird records of the Southern Ocean between here and the Antarctic, and they wanted the data. Okay, well, we can give you a CSV or we can read your database. No, give us Digger. Okay, we put Digger up and we published the very first data set from Australia to Obis and to GBIF at the same time. And you've got there an example of the previous uh, trawl catch from, say, the, one of the Mawson trips, and then the current investigator, which I've luckily enough had about 15 trips on. And it's currently just out in the Tasman Sea studying eddies. Unfortunately, it's not important to have a look at. How does this work? Okay. Back to the start. So we had, um, as I said, 50,000 records, part of that record, part of that big data set. It's now about up to 150,000 records. The initial release of data was only 17 fields, basically a lot long depth. A, and um, a tax and an account, just an individual account. It wasn't anything to do with uh, quantities or anything like that. Um, there was no formal linkages, just published as is, as it was at Rutgers University. It was just whatever was out there at the time. And so there was no formal linkages, taxonomy, etc. cetera. Um, those who know about Digger, it was a very slow, it was a good tool, but it was very slow and was very limited, only about 50,000 records, but extremely slow after that. So in uh, 2008, I attended the Tagwick meeting in Perth and uh, Tim Robinson turned up with his new IPT prototype. And he actually uh, demonstrated to me his, uh, his tool with the Antarctic Plant Database, which is a terrestrial database. At that time, I was doing terrestrial and both marine data sets and uh, would occasionally have to split the data sets into two so Obis and Rutgers could get this the marine component. So I changed it from a streaming service with very we have very limited, uh, I suppose, power into a uh, download service from archive files, which made it much easier for people with very limited infrastructure to actually uh, publish data. And uh, you can see there on the uh, right hand side is the current distribution of the CBER data. That's sort of finished in about 2005. Um, it was regarded as a stamp collecting phase and was killed off for that reason, which is a bit unfortunate because obviously everybody's looking at global change and, and distribution changes in CBER, et cetera. Um, in 2011, I moved to CSIRO because they had a new ship, the Investigator, and I took on the role of publishing to Obis in 2016 when the previous incumbent who managed that uh, process uh, retired. So at that time, there was about 600,000 records, mostly of commercial uh, research vessels in, in uh, research, sorry, sorry, research ships inside the commercial fishing areas like on the southeast of Australia or the west coast of Western Australia. At that time, in 2011, Obis moved to, from into the International Ocean Data Exchange Group under UNESCO. So it actually changed the whole management infrastructure and its purpose, and it was much more uh, controlled and much more benefit for, for managers and policymakers, which is good, because at the moment before that, it was really just a, as a scientific holding place for data, and, and it, wasn't, it didn't have the exposure it has now. The World Register of Marine Species was being instantiated. It started off as a European and then they took over the world 
and then uh, obviously expects all its uh, biological data sets to be linked to that, which is great because it's a global data set and then provide web services to harvest, uh, to match tax and et cetera like that. Um, occasionally we get Australian species, of course a lot of endemic Australian species, and uh, we actually can provide worms with additional names that they can go through their taxonomic editors and uh, add to the register, which is fantastic. So slowly over time, worms has been built up. Now, Ibis has a particular remit. It expects data from only its harvested, only its endorsed IPT nodes. So I am responsible, and along with my colleagues, to make sure the data is the best quality possible. And in the past, I suppose in the past, people will publish anything and anywhere, especially to GBIS and Ibis in the early days. But the, the whole game is to raise the bar of the quality of the data before it gets out the door. So in about 2017, there was this paper on this new data structures of uh, event core and occurrences and extended measurement effect. And that went out in 2017, and we're only just now seeing evidence of that being presented in the portals. And a lot of our data is actually now in that sort of format and ready to be delivered to the ALA and other places where they can handle these richer types of data sets. Just to clarify, it, it's only really three tables. Um, we've, we've got a water sample there. We control, we treat that as like a trawl where we say catching fish. Um, it has an event, which is a trawl event. And that, against that trawl event, you've got a, uh, you have your things like the date, time, precision, net size, tow speed, all those sort of attributes associated with the event. And then you can associate against each occurrence, like those two particular species, there might be some measurements or it could be a specimen, et cetera, like that. So you actually build a very rich structure. And all this is encapsulated around vocabulary, so those measurement types and measurement units can all be part of vocabularies. And obviously expects those to be used in uh, using the British Ocean Data Centre ones, which are quite extensive and are, are quite global in reach. So now, today, we've had probably about 35 million records from, from the half million. We have 450 data sets, representing about 25% of the Australian holdings. The marine estate in Australia is huge. It includes the area, margins around Antarctica, so it's very important. And there's a lot of uh, lot of things to discover still. Um, we're now we're in a process of publishing all that through to into the ALA, so they have a, a much more extensive marine holdings. There's a talk on Thursday about that. Um, in the past, I suppose it was very focused on terrestrial, which is fair enough because there's an awful lot of uh, terrestrial players in the mix. But marine is a bit different because you expect. That data is essentially acquired from very specialised type surveys like vessels and things like that. Um, we published about 45 this in taxa on Obis at the present, and there's about 180,000 taxa. So that's a significant portion of the taxa that has already been recorded in the Obis International Portal. So we've, as we record anything from seabirds, cetaceans, down to microbes. And come, data comes from the ship. Since I live in the data centre that looks after the ship's data, it's very easy to try prize that data out of people and uh, get it published. And also, for those people who don't know, we have eight national reference stations around Australia, which is one in Morel Island has been going for 76 years, but they can't get water samples, and lately they're doing eDNA samples and stuff like that. So a lot of that is uh, there's a huge influx of DNA data from these um, long-term sites, which is really fantastic because they're a core um, sites that help look for change, especially the Morel Island one, is sitting in the end of the East Australian current, which is getting stronger and warmer, and bringing all these invasive species, which eat all the nice native Tasmanian biota. And we're actually losing a lot of our um, uh, large kelp, farm, kelp uh, forests because of the warming waters. Fortunately, in Australia, a lot of the data sets are, are really online or available. And it's a good infrastructure for a lot of the marine data sets around the world, so it's much easier to find them and identify them. What we actually do is we have a huge database now of all these records. None of, the, none of them are stored in files. We always, always put them in the database. And so we can do cross matching across data sets and prevent duplication, do consistent taxon matching across different records. As new stuff comes in, we can compare across different data sets. And, uh, and we keep a log of which ones we've changed and we can potentially re republish those data sets once we have, the, have them improved. So there's some basic checks, which have already been discussed by various people. Um, we have looked at, looked at the um, 
uh, tabric testing assertions and really focus on temporal, spatial, and taxa tests, which are the core components. And, and um, IBIS requires all the data to be in ISO format. I tend to just use the ISO format single string and, and not worry about the separation of year, month, day, just to reduce the data sets. Biologists have very inventive in their data formats. You cannot believe how many variations they have. It is horrendous. I think of anything. <laughs> There's very few data sets out there that are consistent and the same. Global Archive is a, it's a, a, a one particular data set I grabbed stuff from. Pangea is another, but once again, it's so inconsistent. You cannot think of the variations I have for dates, names, and how they're presented, even in the same data set, different formats. I found a regular expression, which is really useful because you can programmatically test whether these dates actually conform to ISO format, once you format look for things like 24 in an hour or something like that. We do spatial tests. One of the advantages of working in the SIRA data center, we have access to a lot of the survey data, the underway tracks, the signal deployments, the water sampling sites, the trawl nets, etc., like that. So we ensure that when we get the biological data back, we can actually validate it that it's legitimate. That map there of the uh, of that voyage is on the on the right hand side is from uh, a trip to Heard Island in uh, 2016 by some seabird observers. That's why there's gaps, because they didn't see the birds at night. But half a dozen of those records were scattered all over the countryside. And once we tie that with the underway data stream, we can actually tie it up. So we have a lot of tools to do that. Very, very important. Um, I should make a note that I said this morning that once data gets published out there and gets out into the real world, you've lost it. It's gone. Somebody's used it for something else, and they might have got a really bad location, and they put that in their data set and done some analysis, and that's it. So we're very particular about trying to make sure all our data sets are as clean as possible. Um, we test our taxa names against worms, water, ocean, uh, well, register of marine species. CAB is an internal or Australian-wide aquatic database of names, precursed uh, started in the nineties, I suppose. Um, we tend to not use that less because it does have Australian names, but we actually try and get them into worms to use a proper international identifier for them. Um, this is a really neat bit about OBIS. Because it's linked to worms, all the database entries there are linked to a taxa that we identify at the time. But if that becomes a, a synonym of a new accepted name, they do the transformations for you. We don't have to worry about trying to keep the names up to date. They do that for us. It's fantastic. It takes a lot of time. So we publish records without worms identifiers because we know there's a lot of stuff in Australia. As long as it looks a fairly legitimate scientific name, we'll put it out there and we'll get feedback. So we've had some excellent feedback from worms, from names we put out there and they've matched them up or identified that they're new records and they go off to the taxonomic editors and get uh, put into the database eventually. We also have a lot of seagrass and mangroves around uh, estate around Australia. So we have mapped that into the polygons we get from them. Unfortunately, Darwin calls it expects a decimal latitude and longitude, so we use it just as a centroid. And it's quite nice that GBIF portal actually shows these polygons. Uh, I don't see that in the other portals, but it'd be really nice if it did. Uh, maybe ALA, I don't know, but uh, certainly on GBIF, it was, really, it was quite presentable. So one thing we found out is that a lot of these data, once it gets into a portal, it looks homogenous. It looks like you know, a big blob of data. So what we've actually... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Mrs. Step. That's the next slide. Of course, life is changing with the uh, how data gets published. We actually tag each of our data sets with the type of pattern that we've currently used. So we can go back to the original data sets and try and improve that and use the extra new new variations like event core and stuff like that. And that helps us improve the data sets and republish and make it a much a richer data set. Um, and so there's a couple of examples of the, of the tagging of our data sets so we keep track of many others. What we do, we keep every single copy of data set as we get it, and we keep it permanent. One of the problems is that some of the, in, especially in the early days, it seemed to vanish. Um, now with, with Dryad and Zendo and repositories like that, it's much, much better. But nevertheless, we want to capture the instance we grab that data, we might have made a mistake. Uh, we can see some variation and stuff like that. So it's very important to keep the original data, and we do that along with the code that transforms it back into the Darwin Cornbooks in our database. That was the biggest thing we should have done in the start. Because when I went to the data center in Antarctic Division, I lost some of those files and never could figure out where I got it from. And it was really a bit unfortunate. 
So um, to me, some of the issues to solve, how to preserve context in the portal when everything is in together. So we invented this type. Okay, yeah, this is the last one. We presented, we created this thing called a current type. Um, if you have a, uh, it's just internal at the moment, but I don't know where to transform the down core. But for example, if I put a catch a troll net in the date in the water, and put get some fish out, that's a catch competition. Three of these, four of that, that's fine. I might take one and measure it. That's a measurement. That's an, an additional record, and I might put a jar, in a jar which is a specimen. So now I've overcounted the amount of occurrences. So to help us differentiate all these typical, re typical records in the database, we've actually created this current type, and we tag up different records that way. So we can actually differentiate and pull out the, the records we need. How that fits into Darwin Core is for future things, but it helps us pull out the measurements, the specimens, or the comp catch compositions, and other types as we want, just as a starting point before we go further. Um, I said it partly matches the, the GBIF dataset subtype, which is quite broad. Uh, this is a more particular for our particular marine type taxa. And it helps us distinguish tracking data from point data. So if I have a track of a thousand records for one animal, it looks the same as a thousand animals. Oh, a completely different scheme of things. Um, we are trying to publish to the tablet tests and outcomes, so that's work in progress. Um, and I had a discussion this morning about how do we actually present that in the thing. If I have 30 million records, do I have 300 million as tests and assertions go with it? I have to think about that. And one of the big things we're looking at is prevention and duplication of records. In the past, okay, this is the very last one. There are data flows everywhere, and one of our big tasks is make sure all that data does not get replicated, because that happened in the past when I was in GBF, and it's a nightmare to sort out. Oh, I've got more. Steve, were there any questions online? No questions online. I think you've got one, if there are wrong questions in the room. <laughs> <laughs>